Hello, good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining. Sorry we're a bit late today. Uh, as you know, our guest is the man on screen there. And uh, actually, it's a shame we haven't got a bit of commentary of him, really, because uh, he's had some dramatic moments in, in cricket, both for England and also for his counties. But I'm delighted to say that Tim Al Mills is our guest tonight. Uh, thanks very much, Tim Al, for, for joining us. Um, sort of quite short notice, really. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, yeah, so you're back in England. And yes. Another round of applause for being part of that fantastic World <laughs> in 20 winning the squad a wonderful achievement and how, how did it feel being being part of that yeah it was brilliant um look obviously i didn't i didn't get to play a game unfortunately which you know as, as a professional sportsman you'd always prefer to be on on that side of the boundary but um yeah i i, so I was doing i was doing a podcast with mark wood throughout the tournament for the bbc and, and one thing when we did kind of our final podcast looking back the one thing that we that we really both agreed on was obviously we won the World Cup, but we had a, we had a bloody good six weeks together. Like regardless of the cricket, we had, we had a really good time. Um, touring can sometimes be a bit of a drag, a bit kind of monotonous. Um, I didn't have my family there. My wife actually gave birth whilst I was away. Woody didn't that have must be difficult. That must be really quite. Was that your first? Second. So yeah, yeah right. second. So um, yeah, I was there for the first, but. Um, yeah, I'm lucky I've got a very understanding wife who did a did a great job. Um, but yeah, we we had a we had a great time off the field and training was fun. Obviously, the cricket went well, but um, yeah, it's probably the one thing I really look back upon as you know having a really good six weeks with a really good group of group of people. Um, and yeah, obviously, winning the World Cup obviously just makes it even better. It must be a kind of you know a fantastic thrill. And obviously disappointing that you didn't get on the field, but that just being amongst that play that that group of players and obviously seeing what they've done since as well. Can you put your finger on what it is about that group that is special? It's tricky to say. I think no, I think in that World Cup we were one of the oldest squads. Um, there was only maybe two, two or three guys under 26, 25. So most of the guys that were in that team and the squad knew their games, knew what they needed to do, had been in big matches, played in, you know, IPLs, played in different tournaments all around the world. So um, there wasn't an awful lot of kind of coaching that needed to be done, I guess. Um, and that's one thing just continuing on from when Morgs was in charge, kind of just empowering players to go out there and 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 um you know be ourselves and and one one message that that Joss kept kind of relaying throughout the tournament is is that we've got some of the best players in the world in our team and every team would fear playing us and he, he kind of kept repeating that and at different points of the tournament you know a few different players stepped up and and um yeah kind of as, as a collective you know you do that enough times you you have success and obviously in the big moments when you need you know you think Ben Stokes in the group game against Sri Lanka, wickets falling at the other end. He's kind of the ever-present, gets us over the line. Obviously, he did the same in the final. Sam Curran um, throughout the tournament. The way Joss and Helsey batted against India in that massive game at, at Adelaide. Um, yeah, kind of our, our world-class players all had world-class moments when we when we needed them. And um, yeah, I think that was probably the key to, to going all the way. It's funny, it reminds me of, of, of days playing with Ian Botham, actually. And I remember team talks. This is for, this is for Durham, but, you know, it was, it was still kind of, it was important to us. We had these team talks and we sort of assess the opposition. And halfway through the conversation, Beefy would just say, listen, lads, forget all about the opposition. We are a good team. If we do our job, they can't do theirs. And it's another way of saying we're good and they're, you know, don't worry about them sort of thing. How does, um, how did Joss, you played under Owen as well. How did Joss and Owen differ as captains? Uh, pretty, pretty similar on, on the field, both very calm on the field. Um, we actually, we didn't have a single kind of structured meeting throughout the world, throughout the World Cup. Um, we, we, we'd kind of, on the outfield at training, we'd sit down as a bowling group and the batting group would, um, would sit down as well and we just have kind of informal chats but 
there was there was no meeting as such you know where you sit down and the analyst and you go through this you know the slides and the, the data and things like that so we didn't we didn't have a single one of those throughout the whole world cup which was different to when morgs was in charge when yeah morgs would sit in on the meetings and we'd have you know we'd we'd have those more formal chats um so that was probably one slight little difference which i think was led led by Joss. Uh, but there's obviously a lot of conversations happening all the time within the group and sharing of information. But um, yeah, they're, they're pretty similar. Obviously, I think Joss is still trying to find his, mm. or sorry, was still trying to kind of grow his way into, into that role, having played under more, because it must be difficult when you play under a successful captain for such a long time to then take, you know, that job and then still find the way to make your own. And we obviously struggled last summer um, when Motti and Joss kind of first started. We lost a couple of series. But you know, obviously, a few months later, we've um, we've managed to turn it around. Which um, which do you prefer out of the the kind of going through the slides and analysing opposition and just being more general and perhaps a bit more informal? Yes, yeah, so I, I like. I don't mind the the, the meetings as a bowling group. Um, I as long as they're not too long, there's definitely a balance. Sometimes I've been in teams before where you really kind of go into too much and it gets a bit rigid and you feel like okay I have to do this this and this and it's a bit robotic but um, especially when you're coming up against teams or players that you haven't played an awful lot against I think it's nice to just go through the batters and what their strengths are but the analyst you can get that from the analyst so Nathan uh, sends out just via WhatsApp kind of these little packs and we get the information so it's not like we're not getting we're just going out there and kind of freestyling it we do have a lot of information it's just maybe given to us in a less formal setting um so yeah, you can have as, you can have as little or as much as you need it's just that we weren't having those big kind of collective uh meetings pre-game and i i suppose you have to still think on your feet i mean it, it's all very well having the plans but in a way the skill of the captain and and all the bowlers is to adapt according to how a game goes you know it seems to me there's there's some real flexibility in that and someone like sam curran kind of grew into a, a role that was probably in mark for you originally yeah and no you're completely right like what you said um when you're talking about in both of them um ultimately you have i'm and i am a big believer of you have to stick to your strengths and you have to do what is what has gotten you to that level there's no point in getting to international level and then completely changing kind of your your skill set just based on what the opposition batter is doing it's more you just have to adapt to conditions adapt to stadium boundary sizes and things like that but yeah look completely it's it that is the what the England team's about at the moment it's it's being aggressive and it's playing your way and you know obviously you're, you're being selected because you can play that way and then, yeah, just having the freedom to do that when you're out of the ground. I, I asked this question of uh, Chris Wokes a while ago. Um, who's the, the most, who's the player that you least and mo most like to be with and least like to be with in the team? You know, who's, well, the most fun, who's the most fun and who's the most annoying? And he said, most fun, Mark Wood, most annoying, Mark Wood. <laughs> so he's sort of both ends of the spectrum. Is that, is that how you see it? Yeah, it can be. Yeah, because Woody's he's obviously a high energy guy. Um, so basically, this this tour. Sorry if anybody's listened to our podcast, you'd have heard all this before. But this tour, there was maybe half of the group that had families, and then half of the group that that didn't have families with them. And we, all, the, us guys that didn't have our families with us, obviously spent a lot of time together. You know, often three meals a day, um, on you know on days off and such. And yeah, myself, Mark Wood, Chris Wokes, Ben Stokes, Liam Livingston, Sam Curran, we all kind of didn't have families there so we spent a lot of time together and yeah when you spend six weeks as I say three days three meals a day pretty much hanging around with with the same people um you can maybe wind each other up a little bit but honestly there wasn't there wasn't that much of it but um yeah Woody Woody's a definitely definitely the type of character that that keeps you know the dressing room going and uh I think he's become more self-aware I think he knows he's, he's a very nervous cricket watcher he's not yeah. Uh, yeah. he's very open I know he's very open about that so he he knows when to kind of take himself away you know, mm. if he's feeling particularly nervous now, whereas I think previously he maybe kind of affected those around. There was one game we were, yeah, we were playing the game at, against Sri Lanka. He, we, he got injured, but we were in the first innings, but he bowled and then we were batting and it was obviously, we weren't doing great. And he was sat in the dugout. He wasn't going to bat, but he was there and 
he had to take himself away because I think he knew that his nervous energy was maybe not great for the, obviously the batters that are waiting to go in. Um, so yeah, he's, oh, yeah, I spent a lot of time with Woody this last last um, last couple of months, and yeah, he, he's one of the blokes that obviously makes touring uh, that that bit that bit more special. And actually, you need people like that, don't you? Because there are times when it's there are disappointments, and obviously in your case, you didn't get a game. In his case, he got injured. You do need people to pick you up because otherwise you can bring the whole the whole lot down. And actually, uh, there's a funny scene in the documentary that I've made about the World Cup 2019 World Cup final, um, where he's sat on the washing machine, yeah, um, and you know he's talking about watching the final in a back room, sat on this washing machine, and you know the spin cycles on, and he's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know trying to concentrate on the game. That must have made him even worse. Um, I'm just uh, give us a bit of a lo- lowdown on Stokesy then, and uh, you know, b- being around him, is that you know, I, I if I just relate that to both them, I mean, both them was obviously an awe inspiring character, but actually, he didn't want people who who cowtowed to him, who sort of um, was sort of, was submissive. He actually quite liked people who were quite sort of not laddish, but but have a bit of banter yeah. and give a bit back and uh you know if he was too dominant he would sort of squash you almost and um, so how's how is stokesy sort of you know away from the game yeah that so you that description there is my um describes as uh, my interactions with with kevin peterson that probably describes him pretty accurately as well uh stokesy's so she's a good lad. Like I haven't actually until this this um, World Cup, I hadn't actually spent an awful lot of time with him. Um, I did I did a couple of Lions tours and things like that when I was younger, maybe seven, eight, nine years ago. But I hadn't played for England with him. I don't think because he missed um, the the World Cup previous um, that I played in. So I hadn't actually played a lot with him. I hadn't spent a lot of time with him. But yeah, again, he was one of the one of the lads that didn't have family out there. So you know, we we did spend a lot of time together now and. Yeah, you, he's very calm. He's obviously, you wouldn't know he's, you know, he is who he is necessarily. If you, if you spend time with him, he's, I'm sure, I'm sure he's been the same way, in, you know, for the lot, however long he's been been playing. Um, in terms of cricket, obviously I ran a lot of drinks to him and saw him in in those high pressure situations. And and one thing I certainly um, took away from this World Cup was was how well he seemed to deal with pressure. There wasn't, Obviously, say we'd be losing wickets, and I'd be going out there running drinks, um, and there wasn't any moment. Again, I keep mentioned it a couple of times that Sri Lanka match when he was there, wickets were falling, and then the World Cup final, he was there. Obviously, kind of wasn't wasn't exactly smacking it everywhere, but every time I went out there, he was, you know, very calm, you know, smiley, engaging. Sometimes you go out there and run drinks, and you can tell, you know, guys are tense or. Mm. really switched on where he seemed he seemed very calm he seemed very relaxed um and especially look, he, he barely hadn't played any t20 cricket either coming in coming into this world <laughs> cup he hadn't played at all we were on the same we flew out there together he said he hadn't he didn't go to pakistan before i missed that pakistan trip with a with a toe injury um yeah so he, he went out there cold skills wise he didn't he hadn't played a t20 game for a long time he said he hadn't really practiced that much either but you know he's obviously just got that he's got that obviously amazing cricket ability and he's obviously also got the innate ability to control emotion and and deal with you know the ups and downs of of a game and a tournament and still kind of switch on when he needs to how about you you you, you've had a a a very topsy-turvy sort of few years yeah uh you know big IPL contract then got injured uh, then sort of back in the England fold then obviously injury again now back in the fold again but didn't get a game I mean, how do you deal with it? And who who's your kind of, um, you know, scratch pad? How do you handle your your vicissitudes? Good word. Um, it's yeah, look, it's tough. I, feel like I deal with it. Unfortunately, I've gotten good at dealing with injury, and it's obviously not a skill that I wish I had. But um, yeah, unfortunately, I've gotten pretty good at it, and I've had. The latest, I had to have toe surgery this summer, so I missed all of the hundreds. Um, I had an infect, I had a pretty nasty cut that got infected, and it was it was pretty horrible. And I, I missed two months of my summer just with a toe injury, and I was touch and go whether I was going to be fit for the World Cup. 
but I kind of just every every and I've had stress fractures I've had you know tears of whatever but I, I keep it pretty simple I kind of I, I give myself two options and it's either you do the rehab and you get through it and you get back to the other side of it or or you retire and you go get a job and every time you know every time cricket cricket wins um and it, you know obviously I love playing cricket and there'll be a time where you can't do it anymore or when your performances on the field don't merit maybe the struggles you you have to get there but I think I look I look after my body really well I don't want to tempt fate or anything but I've learned you know what I need to do um kind of how regimented I need to be just to I know what I need to do now and I know when to take rest and I know when to not get too greedy and kind of you know flog myself playing xyz franchise tournaments going back to back to back you know okay so you might have to sacrifice one here just for the good of the year kind of looking at things more holistically and maybe over a 12 month period as opposed to the next two months um yeah and I've got got a young family now which well, has pressures you obviously you've got you know people to provide for futures to think of etc but um also you come home and you know my my two-year-old daughter doesn't care if I've taken five wickets or, or none and or if I'm injured or if I'm fit so um although she loves coming to watch play cricket we're we're flying off again on Saturday and they're coming with me but um to where back to Australia I've got the big bash um oh, right. playing the first half of the big bash and then oh, yeah to the UAE for the U new UAE competition in January. Oh, so right. yeah, I've got a busy, busy time oh, coming up. You, you have, and you're fit, are you at the moment? I mean, yeah, all good. So yeah, I was bowling. So obviously all throughout the World Cup, I, bowling. I, I almost saw it as a training camp. I was kind of just training. I bowled a lot of overs, did a lot of running, fielding, batting, gym, you know, all those type of things. Obviously wanting to play, hoping to play, but obviously didn't get a go. And then, yeah, just came, came home. I've had two weeks at home now just to kind of, spend a bit of time at home obviously meet my son who I, who I hadn't um hadn't oh, met what an extraordinary experience <laughs> I yeah. suppose now with FaceTime you yes. have at least got a sense of it's not completely sort of strange looking to at a newborn exactly uh, but and, and who are you playing for in the big bash I'm with the Perth Scorchers so I was with them last year as well so we won it last year so I'm going back but only yeah. playing the first half of the competition and then go to the new uh the new UAE league which is starting in January well, at least you should be uh, relied on for a good good weather in Perth, as opposed yes. to the rest of rest of Melbourne, uh, the rest of Australia. Let's just look um, just quickly. Uh, I'm just going to play you um, a good moment from your career. Uh, this is the hat trick actually against Glamorgan. Make that 49 for eight. Tamar Mills now in on the act. Gone, got him! Unbelievable! That is an absolute rip snorter to receive first delivery. Got him! It's another hat trick! Sensational stuff, what a finish, explosive bowling. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the way you wrap up a victory in a T20 game. Well, well expressed by Mark Butcher there. Um, tell us about your your fast bowling. Um, you were sort of a late starter in a way, weren't you? Um, yeah. I mean, where did you get that? Uh, did you know that you had, I don't know, fast twitch fibres or were you always able to to do things fast when you were younger? Uh, yeah, I, I first of all, I loved sport. I played every sport I could growing up, apart from cricket. Um so yeah, where I, I grew up in Suffolk, um, in kind of a small town, uh, went to state school, um, and yeah, cricket just wasn't played. So I, I didn't have access to to cricket, but I played you know football religiously growing up all the way through till I was kind of eighteen, nineteen. Uh, not you know, I wasn't particularly great, but I played you know a couple of times a week for. For, for my club and yeah play basketball to a decent level I always do yeah athletics and things at school and do the you know the competitions that you kind of the school would enter so were you um, a sprinter for instance uh, a little bit I was quite good at jumping so kind of triple jump high jump and things like that yeah so I was I was always powerful um so where do you get your pace from is it power then more than yeah, I'd, yeah I'd say power um you know I'm decently quick but certainly not you know rapid but yeah I'm I'm naturally, basically, I'm naturally quite powerful and, and flexible. I've got quite 
loose joints and you know I'm able to have that kind of delay and that whip in my in my bowling arm so kind of power mixed with flexibility um so that those things kind of coupled are, are a hindrance they cause injury because obviously you're pushing you're kind of you're able to get your muscles and your joints into bigger range and when you couple that couple that with power there's obviously a lot that can snap there but um yeah it, I think it obviously enables me to bowl at a good pace and and the variations where where did they come from is that someone who's has, has influenced you there did you copy anybody not really I think it's, it's tricky to remember I remember back when I was at Essex and I was a youngster and you know I'm playing maybe some second team or trying to get into the Essex first team playing white ball stuff I think just the back of the hand slower ball just came quite naturally to me again I'm Speaking of the flexibility, I'm able to get my arm around the other way without it, you know, hurting my shoulder, or I'm, I don't have to change too much. Whereas a lot of a lot of people just struggle to bowl a back of the hand slower ball, for example, because they can't physically get their shoulder around the other way. Um, whereas that just came naturally to me, and then so then once it was kind of natural, it didn't feel awkward or it didn't hurt. It was then just a case of practicing it until I was comfortable enough executing it and. But it still obviously doesn't go well now, or always go perfectly now, but it goes well enough. And yeah, I always, I found white ball cricket easier than red ball cricket. I struggled with four day cricket. I struggled to be accurate, to be consistent, especially on a lot of the wickets that I was playing on back when, when I was at Chelmsford, you know, playing in division two, it didn't, re- it wasn't really conducive to, to kind of pace bowling. I'd, I'd play, a, I'd probably play more second half of the summer when the pitches were a bit drier, flatter, and um, you needed a bit of extra pace, but um, whereas white ball cricket, bowling short of a length, bowling fast, but with a few slower balls, obviously kind of naturally came easier to me. So I kind of, um, I always found it easier playing white ball cricket. And then I had injuries, obviously, that forced me to to go down that path full time. And it was, you know, it was the best thing that happened to me, really, in terms of my cricket, because it, it certainly accelerated my, my white ball development from there. How many slower balls have you got? Honestly, I bowl two. Right. Well, I can bowl more. So a back of the hander and a leg cutter. So slight slight variations. The leg cutter is slightly quicker than the back of the hander. Um, he would say that though, Simon, wouldn't he? He would say that. Because he's not going to give his secrets away. I mean, of course he is in these, <laughs> in, the, in, these in this environment. So you haven't ever tried to do the left arm spinner version? Oh, honestly, it's no good. Like, I can't get enough can't pace. I, I can. It's just not very good. So basically, I don't get enough pace off the ball with it. Um, oh. it's kind of it just skids onto the back pretty nicely. I'll bowl it now and again, but it certainly what it certainly won't kind of go to it. Um, knuckle ball? No, I can't do the knuckle. I've got very long fingers, and I struggle to yeah to kind of do that motion and then keep it in. You know, keep an actual keep the pressure on the ball and keep the grip on the ball. I, I struggle with oh. with that one. I was going to ask you actually to get to get a ball because I, I I tried to bowl this this one here middle uh, finger. Yeah, yeah, sort of. <laughs> And it, it did come in, it didn't work. But I mean, we <laughs> we um we didn't have so many slower balls in those days. I think Steve Waugh had a back of the hander, actually. And yeah. Dermot Reeve did. But nobody else bowled back of the handers. And I bowled a, an off break and a sort of bit of a leg break. But it, it just, I just wonder, I'm, I'm, I love to watch these these mm. fantastic variations. It's brilliant. So tell, them, tell us about your, um, I've got, I got a little picture here of um the the book that you're associated with yes uh the pace the book of pace it's called yeah that's the one um so so you know what's the kind of origin of that and what what's in it that we should look out for from you yeah so okay i won't long story i guess but a a few years ago um so that's from the company's called pace journal so it's big on instagram we've got you know decent following on there uh, we have um, on obviously the website and then the, the book was the first kind of physical offering we we offered. So basically a couple of years ago, just before the first lockdown, actually, um, the founder of the, the my now business partner, Shabazz, he basically he's kind of a a cricketer that was on the Middlesex pathway, North Ants, kind of fast bowler. And he pretty much kind of ruined himself by always changing his action or kind of obsessing with, you know, all the intricacies of, of, of bowling, but he didn't actually play enough. He'd always, you know, no, I'm not ready. I need to do this. I need to do that. He could bowl fast. And then eventually he pretty much yipped up and, and lost it all. Um, and he kind of went away and then he came back and he started pace journal to kind of interview other cricketers, talk about fast bowling. 
and and help people. And he's he's very talented with kind of media and and graphics and marketing and stuff like that. So we kind of coupled those together, and he was looking for a kind of a a current professional to kind of partner with and to bring onto the brand. And I've, I've done media work and things like that. So he approached me, and um, yeah, I got involved with him and to give kind of my expertise and to also help interview other players and obviously I have resources and uh, contacts to tap into as well so um, yeah we I kind of came on board and, and we kept growing the company and then uh, yeah Shabazz wrote this book uh, it's it's not a, it's, 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 it's kind of a self-help book so it's, you won't find you know drills in there you won't find specific bowling tips as such mm. because in our opinion, it's impossible. You can't write a book for every fast bowler or every cricketer because it's <laughs> cricket is such a broad game, isn't it? And there are so many um, different types of bowler. So basically, it's it's to help. Shabazz initially wrote it, it. It changed forms, but initially to help youngsters kind of avoid the mistakes that he made and kind of over coaching, overthinking, over analyzing, over obsessing, and to be a bit more natural. Um, and I obviously helped him and kind of added inputs here and there and I wrote the foreword and, and yeah, we've had a lot of feedback. It's been out over, over two years now and it's still selling and we get a lot of great feedback from it. And we eventually, we had, we hosted our first, so before, when was this? Before I went to the IPL this year. So in March, we had our first full coaching day at Wellington College. We had myself, Shabazz, we had Rob Arman, who's the England head S&C and, uh, Julian Wood, who's a, a power hitting yeah. coach. Yeah, yeah. And we had a, I think uh, maybe 50, 50, 60 people kind of ranging from kids through to adults. And we ran a, ran a coaching day all to do with fast bowling and, and it went brilliantly. Um, we're going to hopefully run another one this preseason. Um, so yeah, it's just something, uh, my involvement kind of goes up and down a little bit, depending on how fit I am. If I'm, when I'm injured, I'm kind of obviously jump all in and, and use that time wisely. And obviously when I'm playing, I kind of drift back a little bit into the background and let Shabazz take over. But um, yeah, there's, as I said, it's not a how to bowl fast book because you can't you can't write a book like that. I'm sure some people will claim to and will try to, but it's more of something that can genuinely help everybody, no matter if they're a fast bowler or not. Really, if they're aspiring young cricketer or aspiring young sportsman. Yeah, I, I don't think I've never seen a book about that actually tells you how to bowl fast. Yeah. I obviously, wouldn't wouldn't dream of trying to do it either. I, I mean, actually, one of the things I always found was that. I would try and, especially if things weren't going so well, I would try and copy another bowler. Yeah. And um, look at someone who's, I mean, in my era, it was Mal Malcolm Marshall, Michael Holding, um, occasionally Bob Willis, people like that. And uh, I would, if I wasn't, if it wasn't going well, I'd think, right, today I'm going to be like Holding. <laughs> try and glide to the wicket. A yeah. little, little bit like I think Holding does and had that action. And if it was... I don't know, it wasn't swinging it or something. I tried the Marshall approach, kind of running in a bit open chested and uh, sort of, you know, galloping to the wicket and occasionally a sort of silly Bob Willis impression. And then I'd say to people, um, do you see my um, Michael Holding? I tried to bowl like Michael Holding today and they go, you just look like you. you. <laughs> different. So it's in the mind, a lot of yeah. it, isn't it, that you think you're doing something different. But in actual fact, you're just doing what you do. And that's actually the best way to be, really. Yeah. And look, what you've described there is also something that we try and, you know, advise people not to do. Because if if over the course of a five month period, you're trying to be seven different bowlers, you're probably not going to be any any bowler or you're going to obviously and fast bowling is such an unnatural movement as well. If you're if you're doing different things regularly, you're going to hurt something eventually. And um yeah so that's that's one of the main teachings you need to be the sounds corny i guess but you need to find the best version of yourself and and accept how you bowl to a certain degree you know the classic is oh, i'm a bowler who bowls big in swingers but my coach says i need to swing it away no like in my opinion be the best in swing bowler that you can that you can be because that's if you if you can do something if you have a skill naturally like if you naturally bowl in swingers Okay, that's 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 good. You've got a skill, so yeah. make it a super skill, and then then work on your kind of other things around that. Marshall actually was a great one for because uh, I I was a try I tried to bowl out swing, and if it wasn't swinging away, 
I tried to force it so that it would, yeah. you know, yeah. and then you just lose everything. <laughs> and Marshall was a great believer in run up and bowl, you know, with the new ball. And if it swings in on that particular day, use that. Just yeah. use whatever you you're producing that day, rather than trying to force it into to doing what you really want to do. Exactly. Use the assets on 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 show on that on that particular day. Um, one one final question from me. Um, before we get some some members involved, is the Yorker underused? Uh, in one respect, yes, because when it is the best ball to bowl, uh, still, if you execute it, um, speaking as a bowler who doesn't bowl a lot of Yorkers, and the reason I don't bowl a lot of them is because it's not the delivery that I'm best at executing. And as a sim simple man I am, I, as often as I can, I do, I try and do what I'm most confident of executing. I think it's. A, I think cricket gets overcomplicated in some respects. I don't see why you would willingly go out there and do something that you know you're not very good at. So obviously, I then in, in the background and I'm, I bowled today just in indoor school. I was working on Yorkers, so I'm practicing them, and hopefully at a point I'll get to the point where I'm better at and I'm more confident executing in the game. But um, yeah, I think I always fight against it when if you ever get a captain who tells you, okay, bowl, I need you to bowl some Yorkers or I need you to do this. If you're not confident, if, you, if you're not confident that you're going to execute it, you're probably not going to execute it. And obviously the, the Yorker is the ball that if you do miss execute is more often than not, especially at the moment, the way the world cricket is, you're probably going to get hit for six. So um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a harder skill. And that's why those bowlers that are confident and are very good at executing Yorkers, they are the kind of the, you know the most um, sought after in the world. Um, so I yeah. think there was a there was a great example of that in the World Cup that we played in the UAE last year. There was a, an Afghani bowler, um, and he tried to go. It was the last over game. I, can't, I don't want to get the exact um, numbers wrong, but he he tried to bowl six out of six Yorkers. I think he, I think he perfectly executed three of them, just missed one of them, and then missed the other two by a decent amount. Those two that he missed got hit for six. I think the one he just missed got, got hit for four. And then the other three, yeah, maybe went for one. But that over then still went for 18, upwards yeah. of 18 and, and they lost and they lost the game. It was kind of, you know, right at the end to, to defend the game. So you execute three and a half, four Yorkers out of six, you, you're pretty happy. Mm -hmm. And you put, you miss those two and, um, you know, that's, that's game over. But so it's, 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 the, it's the ultimate risk reward, you could say. If you were talking to your 11-year-old self now or your 12-year-old self or whatever, and you're now the age you are, would you, given the way the game has, has developed, would you recommend being, still recommend being a fast bowler? Uh, yeah, well, I never played cricket since so I was 14, so I was still a few years, I was still a few years off. But um, I, I, because I came to cricket late and where I kind of, how I started playing cricket, I didn't play cricket at all seriously until I was 16 really so I was I was always playing catch up I, I could bowl fast and that was about it I couldn't bat I couldn't field I wasn't overly fit so I, I was but I could bowl fast so I was always playing catch up with the other things um so yeah any I if you can bowl fast do bowl fast 100% but I would have if yeah again if I could have my time again I guess I'd do what I'd, I'd be a better batter I'd be a better fielder and I'd have done you know the things I do now physically with regards to gym and training and stuff like that I would have gotten into those habits earlier also um so you wouldn't try and steer what I'm really saying is you wouldn't try and steer a young cricketer away from being a bowler because of the fact that batting is is such a dominant intimidatory brand of the game now no I think I, I think you do what you're good at and again that's what I spoke about when I was speaking about my bowling skill set, for example, I think you always you you do what you're good at and you make yourself very good at it. You got you you got to get you got to be in a, you got to get picked for it in a team for a reason. That's what I always say. No matter if you're playing club cricket, junior cricket, county cricket, international cricket, you you there's got to be a reason for the captain or the coach to pick you, and then there's also got to be a reason for the captain to bowl you. Why why is he going to give you the ball? If because if you're just like everybody else and you know it's toss of a coin, but if you've got a skill set, if you've got something that you're you're good at, that's what you you need. That otherwise you aren't going to 
that's why I said I did a bit of work with the England under 19s a few years ago. And I said to those guys, okay, have it find something that gets you in the first team that the captain knows, okay, he he might be young, he might not have played very much, but I know he's good at this. And then then you've got something you're confident about, that you have an identity. Um, so yeah, find yeah, that's that's again explore that, find your identity, and then you know, branch out from there, I think. Well, uh, you were associated with a, a passage of play that um, in the final of the 100 the year before last, last year, uh, that Mark Nicholas and I was, were, were, were in the stand. And we both said, this passage of play, and it was you and George Garton bowling at, I think, Moen Alley and Liam Livingston, I yeah. think. And we said, this is just unbelievable cricket. You know, the bowling is 90 miles an hour. The batting is trying to hit the ball you know, into King of the <laughs> Fielding is incredible. Yeah. You know, it was like sort of watching cricket on speed. It was absolute. And, and the skill levels were also phenomenal. So that's still in my memory, That actually, that that kind of passage of play. We just, for the, all those people who sort of negative about the 100, we just said, blimey. <laughs> it's, it's extraordinary. So um, so you've left your impression on us, for, for sure. Okay, listen, um, we've got some members wanting to ask you things. Yeah, sure. So um, let's uh, let's open up the, the phone. Well, I'm line. coming on first. I'm coming on You're first, coming on actually. First, we have got some questions. I'll line them up, but I've got a, I've got a very important um, question to ask. But just before I do, Cheeky Richard Shelley, uh, Simon Hughes, has said in the chat, he's glad you described your slower ball because he always thought that was just how you bowled. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> That's He's how on hard. The Christmas card list. Uh, unbelievable. No, my question, my question to you, Tom, is, and you've got intel, I think. Um, my best mate lives in Australia and we always have chirp about one thing. He's been watching the, the goings on in uh, Royal Pindy or Pindy, as everybody calls it now. In recent yep. days, and he's got a bit of ashes. The ashes chirp has started with them, sort of Labrachain and Smith. <laughs> However, he's thrown two words right to me this week, and I've seen a little bit on Twitter. And you must know because I think he also plays for Perth Scorchers, right? Yes. What do you know? What can you tell us about the wild thing, Lance Morris? Oh, uh, yeah, he's, I texted him. So I'm sorry, sure he's been called up to the to the um, Ashes, uh, sorry, to the test squad. He's not, I don't think he's playing, unfortunately, but yeah, he bowls rapid. He's, um, he's, he's very quick. He's, he's a great guy. So I spent a lot of time with him last winter. Um, and I think he was pretty wild. He was wild. He kind of, you know, not shy of a beamer or a few bounces <laughs> in the over. Um, but by all accounts and scorecards I've been seeing, he's really kind of figured it out and he's bowling long spells and he's bowling quick and he's bowling accurately. So, um, yeah, watch out for watch out for Lance um, in the coming months. So when you so, say rapid in that sort of canon of you high intensity heat merchants, where does he sit in that spectrum? Oh, he's quicker than me for sure. So he's yeah. bowling, he's bowling 150 out in Australia, which is, you know, 93, probably so just shy of Mark Wood um, kind of territory at the moment, I'd say. Wow. Okay. And what age? 23, 24. And he's from Perth, is he? He's from WA. Yes. Yeah, yeah, from WA. Yeah. Right. So I'm clearing myself off. Or something then. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Right, right. So incoming first, in order of people put their hands up, I am going to invite Will into the room. Well, so. All right. Evening. Evening all. Hi, Simon. Hi, Will. Hi. Hi, hi Tamar. How are you doing? Good. Thank you, mate. Good. Um, I, I just mentioned there to Simon that you were uh, brought up in uh, in a uh, well up in Suffolk. What uh, what part of Suffolk were you brought up in? Just out of interest. On the Suffolk Norfolk border, so um, a town called Brandon. Oh, Brandon. Uh, okay, near the Elverdon Centre Parks. So that's probably as uh, as much oh, as fine, I. Okay, <laughs> I don't right, expect... well, no, that's no problem. I've 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 got I've got a house up in uh, up in Albra, so I. So, so okay. I'm yeah. No, I'm not there. near the coast. No. 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 no, no that's, <laughs> uh, that's, that's all right. Um, just, just a quick question about because um, obviously you do a lot of uh, you've obviously did a lot of journalism work with obviously Mark Wood and um, all that in order of preparation for the World T Twenty and all that. Just a just a question: Is um, radio or broadcasting something that you'd like to do when you retire, or is that something that you're thinking about maybe further down the line? Or not yeah, really? I say so because I only play T Twenty cricket. I've mm. I've got a lot of I've got a lot more spare time than other you know, county cricketers do who are playing all formats. I, you know, I physically have more kind of days and hours to, to fill. So it was, I think it came about 
so I both, first of all, I did journalism at university out after school, after I left school. Um, so I always had an interest in it and I love all sport. Um, and yeah, I've been lucky enough to have get opportunities with the BBC and with Sky as well mm. as playing. And I, yeah, you know, I enjoy it and, um, I like to think I speak, I speak all right. And, yeah. um, yeah, like, like I keep getting asked back, so I can't be doing too badly. So, no, um, no. yeah, I always, I'm, I'm going to keep, keep pushing on with it and um i'd like to branch into other sports as well you know so i i, I love all sport not just cool. not just cricket but um yeah i'm definitely gonna gonna keep keep trying to do do both but i'm certainly gonna play for for as long as i can because that's what i love first and foremost who's your football team norwich city norwich city. okay fine all right I'm, <laughs> I'm i'm qpr so we're not gonna so so you know we're not gonna okay. not gonna Close. get into not gonna get into that obviously <laughs> <laughs> cheers mate go well thank you take care Right then, coming off his long run up, <laughs> it's the master of the it's the master of the long question. Here he comes. What's he got for us tonight? It's uh, Paul. Do you have your wine, Paul? Oh, good to have a mute. <clears throat> he's on that mute. He's, he's... There we go. I'm on mute. Sorry, <laughs> I'm waiting for you to unmute. Yes, I do have the wine. It's here. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to share a. Um, a background picture. <clears throat> I don't know if you can see that. It's a bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm halfway. Um, this was. Um, you probably won't remember tomorrow, but it was probably about more well, six or seven years ago. I reckon it was at the Oval with Chris. You Wokes. And Chris Wokes. Yeah, you I do remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So me and my two boys we came down. Um, oh, nice. And uh, and got got your autographs. And the the, the boys have still got both the, the can you sign their All Stars caps and shirts and things. They're still in their in their bedrooms on the wall and stuff. So uh, so they, they really enjoyed that. Um, and actually inspired them, you know, big time. So uh, yeah. so thank you for, nice for taking part. In that. I was going to ask him really about um about you. You kind of alluded to earlier about over coaching and stuff like that. I mean, my one of my lads is, is fancies himself as a bit of a fast bowler, and he. The club that I play for, I mean, I do a little bit of coaching, but but there's there's more senior coaches than me, and they they try to kind of drill it into everyone to do the same thing. And and his run up is um, he's got a naturally sort of arced run up, so he sort of arrives at the crease at a bit of an angle, and and he sort of sends the ball better when he when he kind of does it his own way. Yeah. And, and for the last couple of years, they've tried to sort of get him running straight. And you can see when he's running up, he's sort of you know trying to. He wants to do what his coach is telling him, but he's almost trying to think about it too much, and it sort of, you know, it doesn't always kind of come out the way the way that you. Um, and I was more a question for you, really. I know you started late, um, but how, how, how often did, did you ever try and get your? I know you've got that little gallop at the start of your run up. Did you <laughs> ever try and beat that out of you, or have you just sort of been quite stubborn and said, "Look, this is the way I do it, and, and it works for me." So you know, leave me alone. Yeah, sort of it's it's obviously a tricky question because like I'm. I'm a professional cricketer and you know, I'm obviously playing international cricket and stuff. So I, I can say no and I can, you mm. know, forge my own path as such if, if I feel strongly enough about something. Um, obviously, when you're a young kid and, as you say, you, you are impressionable and you're trying to learn and you're trying to get picked for a team or, you know, whatever yeah. it might be, you do feel the pressure to um, listen do to your told. coaches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, do as you're told. If you're a kid getting told by an adult to do something, you know, in yeah. theory, I'm sure most of us are parents here, that's that's how it should work, shouldn't it? But um, yeah, I think if it's clear, obviously without seeing your, your child bowl, mm -hmm. if, it, if, it, if it's clear that one works better than the other, if he bowls better when he does X as opposed to when he does Y, that should be, what you think, you know, yeah. that should be enough, in, in my opinion. Um, yeah. And you speak speak to the kid as well. You know what? Okay, what? How do you feel? What do you prefer? Obviously, get him to try different things because obviously mm. you could try you could try change something and it could feel good and you could work good. But if it's just not working, then it's it's you shouldn't force something. And as you know, I'm not a coach. I haven't done a lot of coaching, but um, I think all the principles that you know I spoke about in the book and um, that I openly speak about, you know, with, with you now, it's just do what feels comfortable, what comes relatively natural, and you know, ultimately do what, what works. And obviously yeah, if you're okay. getting injured and stuff, then you do need to look at things. But if it's, yeah. if everything feels okay, then I think go for that. I guess I guess an ideal example of that's Bummer, isn't it? Because you would never coach what Bummer does, but clearly exactly. you come back to the Yorkers thing and everything like that. You know, he's, he's clearly the best in the world at that and, and it works for him. So I mean, that's, that's kind of what I try to tell, tell my boys, you know, <laughs> just do what works for you um, and, and, and stick to it. But yeah, yeah, I think, I think I agree with what you're saying. Good. Thank you. Thank you. 
Who's next? Right, bringing in. I'm bringing in. Uh, I'm bringing in the. Uh, a, a long time since we've seen her, but it's Becky's in the house. I know. I'm trying something different by not working all hours. It's very nice. <laughs> Good to see you, Becky. <laughs> Hi all, evening. Uh, thanks for joining us. Well, it's been really interesting. Um, what I kind of wanted to ask about is it just feels to me that cricket has changed so rapidly over the last few years in terms of going players going from playing for one team pretty much and that's just it to, I mean, you just mentioned sort of you're going out to Australia to play first off the Big Bash, then you're going to the UAE and just having to play for loads of different teams in a year. And I just wonder if you could talk about what that meant in terms of having to try and play with players you may not have played with before and how that affected your kind of the, the bowling plans and how we, how, and also some of the positives that it would bring in terms of learning from different people. Yeah. So as, so I've been, I started playing T20 franchise cricket in 2016 and like, and yeah, in that winter, I literally, I flew to Bangladesh, played in the Bangladesh Premier League from there to New Zealand uh, to play for the Auckland Aces, from there to the Big Bash, I played a few games for Brisbane, from there to India to play for England, and th- we had a series against India, from there to the UAE to play in the PSL, and then came home for three weeks and then went to the IPL. So within... So you've given me like, jet lag just saying that. Li- yeah, literally. But I was, you know, I was 22 years old, 23, 23 years old, I, you know, single, didn't have family and things like that. So you just do it and you enjoy it. And um, yeah, the more you do it, obviously, the more data is out there on you. That's the thing at the moment. Also now there's that every ball you bowl is logged. You know, I can log into a system and look at any stat if I want to. I can find out anything I want to know about a batter and and anything can be found out about my bowling if, you know, you want to look hard enough. So there's that side of it. That's that's definitely a huge part of franchise cricket. Um, I think it takes the a little bit of the potential for kind of grudges and you know sledging and those things out of it because chances are you have or will play with another that player at some point if you, if you're playing T20 cricket and chances are you are good mates and you'll spend four months sorry four weeks with a, an individual in pretty close proximity in a hotel you know wherever you are and um but then you know so two weeks later you could be playing against them um so it it it, it makes it a lot more friendly i think but like I've, I've found franchise cricket has just been amazing experience, like life experience. I said from a young age, I was so speaking as to what I just, that journey I went on then when I was 23, whatever it was, there aren't many 23 year olds who get to do that. And, you know, you learn a lot. I hadn't been to places like Bangladesh and Pakistan and where you have to, you know, your training sometimes is fitted around prayer schedules and if it's friday you have friday prayers in in islam which obviously take longer and you have to allow for that so those are the type of things you don't think of when you think about franchise cricket and cricket and um those are the things that i'm sure whenever i stop playing i'll I'll look back upon and and you know i think i'm a better person for for franchise cricket and so i think i'm going off on a bit of a tangent there but even like now i'm getting to take my my two kids away with me they're getting to see different parts of the world see different faces different accents and and such so mm. um yeah but from i guess bringing it back to the cricket side of it it does take away a little bit of the needle sometimes they um that that can which but it still does fire because obviously if you don't if, if you spend four weeks with somebody and you don't get along with them you might be looking forward to playing against them <laughs> in, in in a following tournament so um yeah look, I've, I've loved it and it's, it gets harder when when you get older and you have kids and you have family. Like I so said, I missed missed the birth of my son to play in the World Cup last last year. I yeah, we had the World Cup. Then I went to the T10. Then I went to the Big Bash, and I came home for five days and then left again to go on England tour. And like leaving my daughter, my daughter was uh, just she was just under one then, and leaving her when you know you, you're home for five days. Those type of things you know aren't great. But, um, you know, you obviously you do it for a limited time and and then you kind of, you, you look back on it, um, well, hopefully very fondly. Thank you. No, Good thank question. You. Great question. Just as a quick follow-up to that, is it more of an individual sport, do you think, than a team sport in a way? Because you have to be, as an individual, you know, you're, you're talking about the data that's out there on you all the time. So the share, you almost have it, you have a sort of a share price yeah. and a, a value, if you like. And you have to keep, somehow, you have to keep sustaining that value. 
Yeah, hundred percent. So, in in my opinion, and from my experiences, the best franchises um, out there are the ones that genuinely create a team environment and and make you sort of not make you, but well, yeah, make you care for those four or five weeks and want to do well for your team and care about your um, other teammates because it, it is very easy if you're bouncing competition to competition. You're, it can be easy to be selfish, to think about yourself, say your team might lose, but I might bowl four overs, two for two for 20 and walk off happy with myself. You know, that that definitely does exist in, in franchise cricket. Um, Mickey Arthur was really good at that. One example, I was playing for the Karachi Kings in the PSL and Mickey Arthur, who's now Derbyshire coach, at the time he was the Pakistan head coach. And he, before the tournament even started, he got the overseas players together, the six, seven of us, and said, look, I'm not, I'm not too worried about the cricket. The cricket will happen. But the one thing I ask is that for these four or five weeks, you help the, the local guys, the young Pakistani guys, um, you know, buddy up, you know, pick one that you think you can help or, you know, or as many as you can, because, you know, for them and for the pack, this was at the time when the PSL was just kind of starting. It's more than a four or five week tournament. They'll then go back to Pakistan domestic cricket and it will raise the standard of domestic cricket and things like that. And I, it sticks with me that little little bit sticks with me to this day of good coaching and looking at the big picture and creating that that care within your within your team um because as i said repeating myself it um it is easy sometimes just to fly in you know play your four week five weeks of cricket and then you know on to the next one right mr hughes last question from uh members this is robin so after that you and time you can land the plane okay Hello, Timo. Hello. <laughs> Robin Nimmer, good evening. How are you? You, you seem to be, uh, uh, you look very healthy and very fit. And, oh, uh, thank you. Quite quite the opposite to me. I'm a little bit <laughs> older than you. But uh, no, uh, just to get a couple of points, really. I just wondered what you studied at uni. Was it a sports uh, degree that you uh, went in for at uni? Yeah, I did sports journalism straight out of uni at um... At was University this Essex of East University in Colchester, was it? No, University of East London. So uh, um, oh, on the yeah. Docklands, yeah. So I went straight from school down to down to East London, mainly because UEL was closer to Chelmsford than where I grew up was. So my commute yeah. to go to training twice a week was uh, was lesser going from Stratford than it was from Suffolk. So I was, it kind of it it made sense in all all regards, yeah. really. Just touch on the. Uh, the history uh, for me uh, between you uh, um, playing for Essex and then eventually ending up uh, with because I think you've only played for for both Essex and Sussex. Is that right? Yes, so I'm into my. This yeah. will be my ninth ninth season at Sussex. Um, yeah, so basically yeah, I played at Essex. I was on the academy at Essex when I was 17. Right. I think I signed professional when I was 18, and then I yeah. played a few years at Essex, and then I had pretty bad back injuries. Um, yes, absolutely. so pretty much I was in my last year of my contract at Essex when my back kind of it, it happened again and understandably Essex didn't rush to offer me a contract whilst I was um, kind of pretty crook but kind of from my point of view months were kind of weeks and months were ticking on and I was staring down the barrel of not having a job and kind of I wanted to stay at Essex but they just weren't offering me a contract until they were happy with you know they were confident in doing so so in the meantime, I told them I was obviously going to speak to other counties, which, um, yeah. which you know, is obviously my prerogative. And by the time I kind of toured around and spoke to other counties, I, you know, I decided that I wanted to leave. And you know, Essex, you know, kind of had their chance to to keep me and, and chose not to, whereas other counties were more forthright in in kind of that process. Yeah. And and yeah, obviously chose chose Sussex, and I've I've been down here. Yeah, as I said, this will be my ninth ninth season. Yeah. And you can't, there's no chance of you being able to play 50 overs at all. Forgive my a lack of knowledge of your personal history for a moment. but no, uh, I, I probably could, but to be honest, I don't have that much interest in it, to be honest. The, the kind no. of, the, the risk reward isn't really there. Aside from getting into an England team and, and playing in a World Cup, that's the only real reason for me for playing 50 over cricket. And so the I guess the added, added overs and added potential stress and injuries just to maybe play in a World Cup every four years didn't 
you know, it doesn't really make sense to be honest. I'd, you know, yeah. so I'm getting T20 franchise gigs um, pretty regularly and I'm happy doing that. Yeah. And uh, for the uh, blast this, this summer, did you remind me if you played in uh, virtually all of Sussex's games? Yeah, because- I, play, I, play, I played every game until I yeah, split my toe open and um, mm. it, it was pretty gruesome. Um, I had to have surgery in the end, but yeah, I, I played, I think, every game up until that point. I missed, then I missed the last few. And then unfortunately, I ended up missing the 100 as well because it, 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 it kind of escalated yeah. from there. But um, yeah, I'll be, I'll be fit and raring to go for, for Sussex again come, come this summer. Good, good. Um, well, you realise perhaps, or you will in a minute, um, why I'm a little bit tentative about your personal history in the game, because um, I'm actually, I live in Sussex, uh, only uh, half an hour from Hove, um, but I've been born and bred uh, my 61st year, I think, of being a Hampshire member. (laughs) Um, And uh, so I have divided loyalties um, which my wife thinks is quite ridiculous, but still, when the Hove is so close, and I saw some great games this summer okay. uh, at Hove, I have to say, in between my support at the Aegeus Bowl. But, uh, um, I mean, you're what, 28, 29 now? Just on 30, yeah. Just on 30, right. So I, I've been honoured to listen to some of your commentary. It was as touched on earlier and you, it's little wonder that some of the broadcasters come up and and bend in, down in front of you and count <laughs> down here and everywhere because uh, that they your commentaries rather like Stephen Finn, who I hope is still with Sussex. He is, yeah, um, yeah, good. Um, but your commentaries, both of you, have been really superb. And oh, I appreciate uh, that. Thank you. Yeah, very. Always just, always make the best commentators, Robin. <laughs> they're, they're just, they've got more insight into the game. Uh, listen, oh, we, we must let Tim L go anyway. He's, he's yeah. given us an hour of his time. Robin, thanks very much for, for your uh, continued support and, you know, dual support of two counties. Yeah, I've just got you. one more quick question. Um, Sam Curran, you know, he's yeah. uh, obviously a similar bowler in the sense he's left arm to you. Uh, but what what makes him so good? I mean, he's a, he's been an absolute star, hasn't he, the last few months. What makes him so good? Oh, it's it, it's tricky to, to I guess say one thing. Sam's obviously a, a great cricketer. You know, I spoke about earlier that kind of three uh, three dimension cricketer. He's obviously you know he's a batter in his own right in the longer form of the game. Obviously, very good fielder. Um, I'm sure he gets sick of hearing you know of the competitor, but it's it's true. You you in especially in T20 cricket, you've you've got to want to stay in, you've got to, sorry, you've got to want to bowl in those high pressure moments. Even if there's a little bit of you that's a little bit standoffish, you know, it doesn't quite want it, doesn't want the ball in the 19th over, 20th over, 10 to win. That does make a difference. And, and Sam's obviously full of confidence at the moment, which is, um, which is great. And um, yeah, look, he obviously... Is it something about his bowling though? I mean, it, it, for instance, when he bowls a bouncer, it's not particularly quick. But it's not it's not as quick as you. But yeah. he it, it's it he nearly always seems to get it an awkward height, and yeah, he's got quite a quick arm. It perhaps sort of skids at you, so that in a way the speed gun isn't telling you the whole story. Yeah, probably. And he's obviously a short guy, so that the trajectory is completely different. He's very accurate. That's you know, no matter what speed you bowl, if you're an accurate bowler, you know, if he obviously has found he's able very good at finding the the right length for him to hit you know, a bouncer or, or whatever a delivery it is. And if you're an accurate bowler and you can put the ball in that area more often than not, um, you're going to have success. So, yeah, he's obviously, he's an accurate bowler and he's, you know, he uses, you know, he doesn't use his, say, lack of size to hide behind. He, he maybe finds a way to turn it into a into a positive. Mm. Well, anyway, he's been, it's great to see so many left armers actually bowling. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fantastic. It's been a real... Um, development in the game over the last few years anyway listen thank you for your time yeah. today uh Norts, have you got something to add there did you want to just say no uh me no i was just saying uh no thank you very much time Mel. and uh yeah keep that keep that medal in a safe place yeah of course thank you very much everyone and, and good for, luck with everything and i mean yeah. you know it's been tough for you but you're still smiling and you're still things could be much worse well, things could be much worse, and <laughs> you know you've done an amazing amount already. So uh, feel proud of it, as I'm sure you are. 
No, thanks everybody, and thanks. Right, for, and have for a great trip to Australia. Christmas in Australia, not not too bad. Exactly. Excellent. All right, great. Well, thank Cheers, you, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks everybody. Take care. Cheers. Bye.